You're listening to the Smoke Meat Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Pittman. Smoke Meat is brought to you by Joe's Underground at the corner of 8th and Broad in Augusta, Georgia, in the bottom of the Lamar building. Ah, such a great place to go. I love them there. They've made me feel like family the first time I walked in, and they've always made me feel like family. They believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. They helped me start this show, and I love Jeremy and the gang for it. I go every chance that I get. And uh, you should, too. Remember, I goes to Joe's, and so should you. That's Joe's Underground at the corner of 8th and Broad in Augusta, Georgia, in the bottom of the Lamar building. Today, my friends, we have got a rare treat. Such a great guy on here. We have one of the, one of the on-air personalities and the owner of W4CY Radio. That's right, we've got the pipe man on here today. And we just had a great time talking about a little bit of everything. So we're going to get this piece kicked off right here on Smoked Meat. Hey, so how the hell are you today, Pipe Man? Oh, I'm doing phenomenal. How are you? Any better, I'd be big old fat ugly twins. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So you must have a face for radio then. Oh, I've got the perfect face for radio, man. Oh, I do. Oh, yeah. I'm... Let me see. I'm about 5'10", about 300 pounds, and uglier than farting in church. So. Wow, wow. <laughs> well, I'm 5'7", a buck 38, and I was diagnosed five years ago with diabetes and reversed it all with food. But people are like, how would you get diabetes? You're not, you're, not, you're not fat. And so that's misnomer. You don't have to be fat to get diabetes. Diabetes is not prejudice. Yeah, not a bit because I'm fat and I don't have it. <laughs> so. Yeah, see that? Yeah. And it's people like you that piss me off, man. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I'm healthy. I eat healthy. I'm active. And, you know, I, I get the I get all this stuff. And then I see people like two of my best friends are like big as a house and they don't exercise at all. And they just sit around and they eat like crap and uh, they're fine. And me, I got to go through all this bull crap. <laughs> well, I tell you, you know, I've been a member of a gym here for about three years now. And. It just hadn't really made that much of a difference. I'm actually going to go by there and find out what's going on, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired yeah. of paying for that. Well, it did make a difference because it, it, it made your, your bank account lose weight. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm I, And, you know, I'm used to being poor. When I was a kid, we were so poor we had to share mouthwash. So that's poor. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you had some to share, right? Uh, yeah, you got a point. You know, Christmas was good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, no, man, I've been listening to some of your shows, man, and I'm loving them. You, you just kind of, you make me proud. I'll put it like that, you know. And I, I love shows that just like to have fun, and, you know, they teach you a little something here and there, too, and that's that's always a great thing because you got to have some, some educational value. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're not having fun, what's the point of being in this business? You know what I mean? Exactly, exactly. And uh, you know, I I used to love doing radio when I did it full time. It was so much fun. And I, I actually started at a little station in McRae, Georgia, and uh, it was WYSC. I, I think they're actually still on the air. They survived me, but uh, it was what we called a dollar a holler station because a thirty second ad was actually a dollar. Wow. You, you got a deal if you got a 60-second spot because it was a buck fifty. Nice. We did a lot That's... of commercials. <laughs> Is that during the times when, like, my dad used to say you used to go uh, to the deli and get a corned beef sandwich and Dr. Brown's cream soda for a nickel? <laughs> it was, oh, man. It was about 30 years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. I, and you know what I was getting for a dollar 30 years ago? <laughs> what? A pack of cigarettes. A pack of cigarettes. <laughs> now, now, now you have to uh, not pay your mortgage to buy a pack of cigarettes. Oh, man, they, they done got high enough now where I'll just make my own. I went and bought a little yeah. machine and I buy the rollers, and, I mean the, the rolls with the filter on them and the pipe tobacco, and they're like three cents a piece when I do them. If I, do, if I buy them. They're like forty cent a piece. I'm like, no, I'm gonna die, but I'm gonna be cheap doing it. So yeah, I quit smoking a couple years ago. But the last place I smoked, I was in Hawaii, and cigarette packs were fifteen to twenty bucks a pack there. Ooh, 
Holy crap. Yeah, I, I believe I, that I would even, make me quit. I don't even know how kids can smoke today. Like, you know, at least – at least in my day when I started smoking, there, it was like 85 cents a pack. But even then, you didn't even have enough money for that. So they used to leave the cigarettes out, you know, in the grocery store right out mm-hmm. in a rack right by the front door. And you just walked in and took a pack mm-hmm. and left. You know, nowadays, you know, you got to show ID. You got to – they hide it behind something. They lock it up. And then and then on top of it, it costs you uh, $10 million. I don't even know how these kids smoke cigarettes, to, to be honest. I, I you know, I would have never – they pay as much for a pack of cigarettes as I did to go to a concert and get a T-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's one good thing about back then. We had some really good concerts. Everybody, oh, no doubt. Everybody picks on me and says I'm old. I say, hey, at least I got to see the good bands. Yeah, I don't know if I can remember them, but, yeah. Yeah. They were good. And I lit – you know, I grew up in Jersey, but then for high school, uh, 1980, I moved to California. So I basically lived on the Sunset Strip during that crazy times of, of the Sunset Strip. That th- They don't even exist anymore like they were back then. That's why I say, you know, if you remember the 80s at the Sunset Strip, you were not having a good time. Yeah, you just drove down the Sunset Strip if you remember it in the 80s. Yeah, no doubt. Oh, man. I'm, I'm a little bit jealous. I ain't going to lie. I mean, I've, I was in small town Georgia, and, you know, it, it was enough to where the, the stores in my town did not have tapes that were new. We had to go, you know, like two towns over to the big store to buy a new release tape. Yeah, that sucked. Well, and I bet in your town it would be da- a, a dangerous for somebody like me because I'm a Yankee and I'm an Italian Jew. So I, I probably would not have made out of your town alive. Oh, man, the Yankee part would have killed you right there. <laughs> no doubt about it. I have a funny story about that. So I was driving cross-country in California. I was just thinking about this the other day. It's so funny. I must have been like – actually, I was driving back to New Jersey from California, 19 years old, and I was in Louisiana. <laughs> and, you know, back then we didn't have mobile phones. We didn't have social media, so, and you didn't have online dating sites. So one of the great ways to pick up on women was when you were driving down the road. Mm-hmm. Like it literally there were I, – I can't tell you how many women I met by driving down the road, and then you're like playing tag on the roadway. And so there was some girl. She was really hot driving down the road in Louisiana, and we were playing that tag, and then we both ended up pulling off into the service area. Met up, and I didn't need to get a hotel that night because I spent the night at her house. But it was so funny because she, I think she just wanted to be with me because it was so wrong because I was a Yankee. Like, she kept saying the whole time, like, I can't believe I'm sitting here with, and I'm doing this with a Yankee. And it was like, <laughs> it was like such taboo. And it's like, man, I hope my parents don't find out about this, you know, type of thing, you know, and, and I mean, she was an adult, but, you know, you know how it is. And we were in the back, back bayous of Louisiana. Like, uh, I, I'm surprised that I spent the night and I got out alive. And, like, maybe she would have used me and then smoked me for meat in the morning or something. <laughs> oh, man, we have some pipe jerky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah. But, no, nowadays you'd be all right. I mean, we, we're full of Yankees down here now, so I can live with it. You'd, you'd be fine now. But yeah, well, I don't know. It still scares me. I, you know, how many times I've driven from Jersey to Florida and Georgia is the scariest part to get through. And especially, you know, back in the day when you had a radar detector, like you went to jail in Georgia for a radar detector. I remember being warned like that. You better take your radar detector and put it in the trunk when you get through Georgia. Yeah, man. They, they used to hit people hard over those things. And it's like, really? Come on. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, no doubt. There's nobody on the road. Who cares? You know, I'm just trying to get through your state. That's all. Yeah. So the only reason I'm coming through is because I don't want to go around and go through Alabama. Yeah, uh, that's even scarier. Yeah. You know, I found out that the toothbrush was invented in Alabama. What, oh, really? Yeah. Anywhere, and they don't even use one there, do yeah, they? In, anywhere else to be called a toothbrush. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> well. You know, it is funny where I am here in South Florida. Okay, our studio where I'm in right now is Wellington, which is about as posh as it gets. It's all the polo and equestrian, you know, bougie, snob-ass people. 
And the town right next to us, it's called Loxahatchee, and we call it Loxa Scratch Me because they still <laughs> – they still lynch people in Loxahatchee, and I, I'm not even kidding about it, you know. And yeah. if you have t- a, a full set of teeth in Loxahatchee, that's how they know you're not a local. <laughs> I've been those places. I think I've lived those places before. But, um... Oh, there's this place called Boonies, and like the when they give you the cu- uh, the cups for your uh, drinks, they're from like the dollar store. <laughs> and there's always a fight every night, but the best part about it is it's not guys. It's a girl fight. Two redneck girls just having at it. It's that's the entertainment. Oh man, that's those, like the that's live entertainment right there. Dude, those are more dangerous than guy fights. I'd rather have, see two guys gun fighting than two chicks fighting down here. Oh, yeah, no doubt. That gets <laughs> that gets nasty quick. They fight dirty. That's the kind of chicks that'll hit you with a lamp. Oh yeah. Okay. There's no rules whatsoever. And then behind the place is, is it's supposed to be like a secret, but everybody knows about it. Is that an actual real whorehouse? <laughs> like you have to you have to cross the alligators in the swamp to get to it, but it's there. <laughs> nice, nice, classy. You know, you got to figure they got security, they got the alligators. You know, they care for their customers. They say yeah, there, no, the that, customer that, always comes first. Absolutely. <laughs> oh man. So so how long have you been doing radio pipe, man? I know it's been a minute. Well, see, that's an interesting story because I don't even come from the radio world. So I used to be very big in the investment business uh in my previous life. Uh and I used to pay to have a radio show. And you know, to get my leads, you know, I own commodity brokerage firms and a broker dealer and insurance and all that. My mainstay was commodity. So when you saw those and listen to those radio shows about go, buy gold, buy gold, that that was that was me. Okay. And uh, so then I, I'm also a motivational speaker. And so when I left the investment business and I started doing the motivational speaking full time, again I was doing radio shows to uh, you know get people to my seminars and to, you know, help people, empower people and all that. So I went from like going on the radio to take people's money and invest in pork bellies to actually helping them to maybe get their money back. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, so then, you know, I had done that since I was like 21 years old and, you know, I started back in 1989 and so all through the years, I was not from the radio business, but I was around the radio, and, and I did it from the other side of the fence. And then, so it was 2008, we were in the supposedly worst economy in U.S. history, uh, and, you know, and we were in the recession, all that crap, and I had just gone through a divorce. I went from making 150 grand a month in the investment business to broke, homeless, no vehicle, no money, no nothing. And that's uh, that's when I had this brilliant idea of, you know, I think I'm going to open my own radio station. Mm -hmm. And so the thing was, is that Internet radio was just in its infancy at that point in time, Mm -hmm. you know, and nobody really knew much about it. And most of it was crap. And I, I considered myself like Bill Gates and the rest of them IBM. And what I mean by that is is, you know, Bill Gates had this concept. He went to IBM with this concept of a PC in every home, and they were like, you're nuts, you're crazy, that'll never happen, the mainframe will never go away, and we know how that story ended, yeah. you know? And so I was the same way. I was like, internet radio is going to take over, you know, and ter- terrestrial is going to go away at some point in time, and you're going to see your, you're going to have internet radio in cars, on phones, and we didn't even have smartphones then, you know, and it was like, you're going to have it on tablets and phones and this and that. And I was really ahead of my time with it. But the one thing I noticed, because I was at some small internet radio station down here in Florida, and they were doing it out of their home, and like they, their dog would come up to the studio table, which was their dining room table, and the cat would be walking on the table. And like I was embarrassed to bring a guest, you know, and it's like, this is ridiculous. And I, I was up in New York in real studios in New York before, so it's like, you know, I do believe this is where internet radio is going, but not done like this, you know, and not done DIY. You know, my whole philosophy was 
is if you're going to do a station, it has to be just like a terrestrial station. It has to have the look and the feel and rent like a real radio station. So I got, you know, fancy studios, state-of-the-art equipment, got professional engineers, you know, things that other internet places weren't doing. It was like the whole concept of, hey, I can do it out of my home. Like, just didn't appeal to me. Like, that that doesn't make you a radio station. You know, I'm going to do it at my home off my laptop, no mixer board, no nothing. And I just thought it was absolutely ludicrous. So I did it the right way. And and then, you know, I had a different, you know, we were just using Internet, but we were doing it the same, and we would do live remotes. I mean, we did everything a terrestrial did. And that's really where it all started that was the beginning and uh here i am today 13 years later sweet yeah i remember doing remotes you had to carry that marty around with you i hated that thing oh yeah that's a pain in the ass that's yeah. what you hire a team for because like you know i did a lot of live remotes and now it's like instead i just bring a recorder and record interviews because really you know what those live remotes aren't that great anyway. Most of the time, there's really nothing going on except a bunch of noise for the radio, meaning, mm -hmm. you know. And then you have to set up all this crap, break it all down, bring it with you. It, it's a lot of work. To, yeah. For, for what purpose? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I miss doing radio. That that was such a fun gig, and um, you know, I I understand what you're saying. You know, your your equipment. Well, talent will get you so far. I mean, if, I mean, look look at Robert Johnson. You know, one of the greatest blues men ever. You know, just on what he they they recorded him on. You know, it's horrible audio, but you know he's great. Imagine Robert Johnson recording today. I mean, exactly, it'd be a life changer. You know, and I when I started this, I, I knew I wanted to get a board, and I bought just a, a smallest, cheapest board I could find that. You know, I couldn't even do phone interviews on it. It didn't even have effects out where I could just do a mix minus. And uh, I upgraded, and I just now, about a month ago, upgraded to a new board. That this thing is amazing. You know, I love this thing. It's that, that Zoom L8. Yeah. Great board for podcasting. Yeah, see, and just to give you an example, and you'll understand this, I'm in my studio right now talking to you, and I'm using my board talking to you, and... My board has 24 pots in it and two, two separate effect things, mm -hmm. plus an equalizer. So it's a major board, you know, and, and nobody in Internet radio uses stuff like this. But we also, we, you know, we've had full bands come in the studio just like they would on Howard Stern or something like that and perform. And, you know, we have the ability to do it and do it right. Yeah, and it, it feels good, you know, and I, I love my mics. Um, I used this road pod mic and I tell you, I'd put it up against any mic I ever had on the radio. I love this thing. It's the shock mounts built into the capsule. It's got the pop filter built right in. And I mean, it was 99 bucks for the money. It's an I, awesome mic. That's nice. Yeah. You'll have to send me a link to that. I'll have to check that out. What we use in the studio here are audio technicas mm -hmm. and they're pretty good mics, but that sounds pretty cool, too. I'd like to check that out. Sure. Very cool. Yeah, I'll send you a link to it, man. I will definitely do that because I'm always up for helping folks because that's, that's how we do this. You know, you got to help people. And, uh, Absolutely. And that's the other thing, too. I run my radio old school, like not the corporate radio bull crap, which ruined radio. You yeah. know, I, I've had people from the local terrestrial stations here come into the studio and they're like, and, and even do shows here and stuff. And they're like, wow, it's like radio used to be, you know, when it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my first station, that dollar holler station, my guidelines were don't cuss and play your spots. Yep. And that was my only rules. And that was so amazing. I had such a good time. Like it was when Eggy Break Your Heart was big. Oh, there you go. And uh, I despise that and now, song. Because... And now we have, instead of that, we have Miley twerking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I got to where when anyone would call and request that song, I would play it. But I would play it by Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but, yeah. And then, you know, I, my, the last station I was at, it was a great station. I was on overnights, and my, my programming director, he... 
he gave us our list and I mean, down to the second, everything. And he would tell us, take requests. Okay. I'd take requests. Then he'd call me like three in the morning. Why are you playing this song? It's a request. He's like, don't take requests. Well, you told me to. And he said, no, just wow. tell them that. Said if, if they don't hear their song, they'll think they missed it. And if they do hear it, it's probably in the rotation anyway. So you'll be a hero. I'm like, well, that's garbage. And, uh, well, you know, what's weird is the, the rules for Internet radio. And a lot of the Internet radio people don't know there's actually regulations. Do you know that you if somebody requests a song on Internet live Internet radio, you can't play that song for at least an hour. Hmm. I did not know that. Like, what's the plan for requests then? That's stupid. But, yeah, that's they're, the regulations, like, it's so funny. They're lax in so many areas that they probably shouldn't be, mm-hmm. and then they're strict in the stupid areas. Like, you also, like, remember the days when you could do a block of songs by an artist? You can't do that in internet radio. You, you cannot play more than two songs within an hour by the same artist. Oh, man, the Friday Night Friday. Rock block would be gone. Yeah, there is not. You can't do a rock block on internet radio. Oh man, I don't like that. I don't. I'm glad you can still do two in a row. I mean, two for Tuesdays is a staple everywhere. Yeah, I don't know, even know if you can do them two in a row, but I, I have to. I don't remember. I have to look that up. And then the other thing is because I also that's the other thing about running a real radio station. Like I pay for licensing with ASCAP, BMI, Sound Exchange, CSAC. I do reporting, pay royalties. Most of these internet people are not doing it, and they're actually breaking the law. And, you know, I'm a firm believer, too. I believe in the artists. The artists are getting screwed enough nowadays yeah. that, you know, they deserve to get paid. And when I talk to other people in internet radio, they're like, well, they should just let me play their song. And I'm like, uh, well, do you work for free? You know, like, that's what you're asking them to do. No, that's Let them get paid. You're getting paid. Let them get paid, you know, because... You know, some of these radio stations are making money and they're not paying, and it's, I think it's not fair at all. So we do all that legally, and, you know, so that's why we're very much into the rules and the regs, and as much as I hate the rules and regs, you know, you got to do it right because that's the other thing. That's the other reason you're going to stick around, yeah. you know, because they're already starting to crack down. And I remember a couple of years ago, they shut down a whole bunch of radio stations, like 16,000 radio stations that were including Live 365 for violating these rules that nobody, most of the people didn't even know they had to follow the rules. And even Spotify got fined like a half a million dollars. Oh, excuse me, man. Yeah, that's, you know, I, I believe in, I, I don't do music that I haven't paid for because that's garbage. Like I say, that's, you got you to pay your, the people who make this music, they don't do it for free. And, yeah, uh, and they're all right. Screwed. Yeah. And especially now during COVID, because the only way they make money nowadays, like, I mean, they get a couple cents on a stream. It's not like the old days. So they, the only way they make money is touring, and now they can't even tour because of COVID. So I, I want to tell everybody and tell your listeners and everybody, support your artists right now because they are hurting, and we need them to stick around because that's the only sanity we have right now because the freaking world has gone insane, man. We need music for some therapy because – I, I tell you what, I I don't even know anymore. Like, just whacked out of their mind uh, yeah. right now, and uh, for good reason. I mean, it's it's a it's a wild wild time. It's funny the uh, the other day, you know, we're in South Florida. We have storms all the time, and this girl I'm friends with on Facebook, she she uh, was talking all this conspiracy theory because there was lightning going on that night, and I, <laughs> I just commented, I'm like. Uh, you do realize you live in Florida, right? Like that's kind of normal here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, I, don't even get me cracked up on conspiracy theories. I love them. I, I can do I can do shows about those. Oh man, I love them. Oh well, I, they're they're out full force right now. Oh like, no! I used to work. You know, I, I used, used to what? I used to work with a guy who was really hardcore into them, and he believed every one of them like really big. And uh, we were on the ambulance one day, and it was hot. I mean, it was so hot you saw birds pulling worms out of the ground with oven mitts. And we had stopped by the store, and he had gotten a nice cold Pepsi. And we're sitting on the porch of the station talking, 
and I start telling about dihydrogen monoxide. And I said, man, the government, it's in everything. It's regulated through the government. I said, I mean, if you have too much of it, it can kill you. If you don't have enough of it, it can kill you. It's that dangerous. And uh, I said, it's even in that Pepsi you're drinking right there. And he took this ice-cold brand-new Pepsi and threw it across the yard. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He says, it's got dihydrogen monoxide in it. I said, that's water, H2O. <laughs> yeah. But, oh, yeah, De- during the um, Mayan calendar thing, I thought we were going to have to put him down, man. Oh, it was brutal. But he's well, so how much about fun. This? As a Jew, I love this one. There's the guy, David Icke, out of uh, um, England, out of the U.K. He's he's the one that basically started pretty much every conspiracy theory. He's the one that it started the whole thing about the New World Order and that uh, all these world leaders are all alien, reptilian shapeshifters and the whole thing. I've but seen he those also, videos. He also, okay, he has this theory well he has two theories about the holocaust one is that it didn't happen okay but the other theory that he really spreads a lot is that the jews paid hitler to do it (laughs) and it's like come on can can you people and there's people that follow this dude it's like come on people can you use a little common sense like nobody has common sense anymore Uh, yeah the jews paid hitler so that he could kill six million of their family members. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> like, I mean, there's some family members that piss me off, and certainly I wouldn't mind, but not six million of them. Yeah. And I certainly wouldn't pay somebody to do it. I, you know, I, I would do it myself. You know, I, I would I pay somebody to do it. Yeah, I, I want to keep my money. I don't want to give it to somebody else. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man, yeah. Like, I've seen the shape-shifting videos, and they're hilarious. Well, that's what's supposedly going on right now. This is all part of that. This whole COVID thing is all part of the reptilian shapeshifters taking over, you know, and that's why – that's the reason why we have to wear the mask and social distancing. They're conditioning us right now, and, you know, it's pretty funny. I've interviewed some uh, bands recently that are in other countries, and we were talking about the whole idea of how here in the United States – uh, you know, we think that wearing a mask is, is some conspiracy to take away our rights and freedom. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, it's like, do I like the mask? No. Well, I have to wear it one percent of my day. Like, I don't have to wear it at home. I don't have to wear it in the studio if I walk in a store. So big freaking deal, you yeah. know, and like, so what if it doesn't work? At least it's something. It's not some conspiracy to try to control me. But here's the thing. In other countries besides America, they have a little bit of common sense. And so I was talking to these other artists, and they're like, yeah, in in our country, as soon as they told us to stay home and social distance and not wear masks, we all just did it. We didn't think our rights were being taken away. We didn't think our freedoms were being taken away. We just did what they said, and guess what? Now we don't have any cases, and we're doing whatever we want. And that's the problem. These idiots, and we have a lot of them here in Florida, let me tell you, I got some great stories, but, you know, I mean, this is why we're still dealing with this now, and it's getting worse. Like, let's just buckle down, do what we got to do, and end it already. I mean, we have people down here, I, I, I kid you not, okay, that take their mask off. I've seen it firsthand, take their mask off to cough. Like, you, you do realize that's the whole point of the mask. Then there's these other people that cut a hole in the mask so they can breathe. Yeah. Again, Floridian stupidity. And then, you know, we had it good down here, okay? So you could go boating, which is a great way of social distance. You get out there, you're by yourself, you're sunshine, vitamin D, fresh air. Mm-hmm. These idiots are sitting there and... Instead of doing that, they're tying all the boats together, going to a sandbar and partying like it's like uh, we're having a you know end of the world party or something, you know. And it's just oh, I mean, we are the land of real zombies. You remember that, and that's a true story. That we had people on those bath salts that were became zombies down here. Like this place, uh, you know. I'll tell you what, I, as a New York, New Jersey, Italian Jew, I feel safer in Georgia in, in your hometown than I do here, I, I tell you, because at least people there are smarter, except 
I did see a picture of the Georgia schools opening up, and that was a pretty scary sight if that picture is true because yeah. it looked like people were just like sardine can together and no mask. To me, I was just picturing this Corona Petri dish. Yeah. And then, Jesus Christ, Walmart, okay? Like, I don't like Walmart on a regular day. Jews don't go to Walmart. Like, it's just not our style, okay? Mm. But now I drive by Walmart, even when we were locked down and places were closed and Walmart is supposedly essential. I don't know what it's essential for. I, I, is it essential for beating your kid or is it essential for, you know, killing you? I don't know what it's essential for, but it was essential for something. And you would think it was Black Friday every day. The place is like I'm driving by and going, oh, my God, I don't even want to be anywhere near there. That's like just an infestation of coronavirus. Oh, in and, and, and the, their defense now, if you spend much time in Walmart, you're pretty much immune to corona. <laughs> it is well, not yeah, the worst thing you'll ever be exposed true. to, I promise. <laughs> well, that is probably true, but that is one the place where I was standing there and saw somebody take their mask off to cough in the store. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, talk about the schools. You know, it's my youngest daughter starts her senior year on the seventeenth. Oh, and, uh, that, that sucks, man. Because it's their senior year, but at the same time, you know, they do have a a choice where they want to go to school physically or do it online. And as bad as we hate it, we're going to do online because, you know, like I say, they may you can put all the things in place you want, but a teenager's not going to stay six feet away from their little group and. You have nah. their mask on. It's not going to happen. Kids are not going to do it. You got to make them. It is what it is. And I, I hate it because oh, no it's, a, it's our senior year. We got into so much crap during our senior years, man. And uh, but I'd rather her have a freshman year of college. You know, I yeah. don't want her sick. Oh yeah, and, and the fact is, is you're right. Because when you're a teenager, you're just stupid. Like. I remember studying in psychology class in college that the uh, the definition of insanity is adolescence. Like if you want to have a case study for – like they, they literally said – the professor was saying that teenagers are literally textbook insane. And, and I think back to when I was a teenager, and that is so true. I mean like this – I, I'm surprised that I am still either alive and not in prison for the rest – or not in prison for the rest of my life or both from the shit I did it as a teenager. Oh, man. Just... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember watching MacGyver and learning stuff off of there. You know, me and some of my friends actually made a damn info bomb and nearly blew out the side of this guy's pond dam with it one night just because we saw it on MacGyver, and it worked. <laughs> my – one of my friends brought a bazooka to school. <laughs> Checkmate. <laughs> oh, my. And then I remember there was this one dude we didn't like, and we used to wait for him to walk by my friend's house, and we would shoot him with a BB gun as he was walking by. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. We used to make potato cannons. Yeah. And, oh, I mean, you ain't lived. You've launched a potato 300 yards. Oh, yeah. No doubt. And then aim it at your friend who was 20 yards away and just to watch him run. That was the best part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think and we... then I, I remember being in the vice principal's office like pretty much every day <laughs> and just denying until I die and just laughing to myself like, you are not going to be able to prove shit. <laughs> like, he, he kept trying to catch me in mope. I remember one time something happened. He had a phone recording of me. This was before we had cell phones. And he, he played it for me, and he's like, tell me that isn't you. I'm like, nope, not me. <laughs> <laughs> and then my dad was oblivious, so I used to sign the signature card. Like, my dad was a heavy partier. So, uh -huh. like, any time I just wanted to ditch, I just wrote myself a note. <laughs> no, if he'd ever signed one normally, he, you'd have gotten in trouble for that one instead. Yeah. Oh, no doubt about it. <laughs> Oh, man. Speaking That's... of my dad, talking about the stuff you're talking about, here's a great story. So I, I was in California in high school, and my dad had this big red Buick. And I decided to take it four-wheeling in the mountains. Oh. <laughs> and then it was fine 
until I got to the bottom and there was like this huge manhole cover that was sticking up and it hit the muffler and knocked the muffler off. Oh. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and so I had this friend that was a mechanic. I brought it by his shop and he just wired it up with a coat hanger. <laughs> He's like, just drive it straight home because that thing's going to fall guaranteed when your dad takes the car to work tomorrow. Like, do not drive it too far. It's only holding it up to get you home. Sure enough, so and with me and my best bro, because my best bro ran away from home and lived with me and my dad. We bring it home. The next day, my dad goes to work, and he gets home from work, and he's like, boys, you're not going to believe what happened to me today. <laughs> I'm driving up the 101 coming home, and the fucking muffler fell off. <laughs> and it was everything in our power to just not die laughing like we had to hold it all in man but it was like and i i i don't i don't even know if i ever admitted that one to him you know how when you you get older there's shit you admit to your dad dad or your mom like that they didn't know that that oh, they yeah. thought they see my kids didn't get away with stuff like that i i was two steps ahead of them all the time you know it was funny. One time, my two older kids, they were looking to sneak out of the house. And uh, I was, you know, back when you didn't have cell phones, you could eavesdrop on your kids' conversations. You know, you had the landline, and you just picked up the landline in, in your bedroom and listened. And they had this elaborate plan to, you know, get out of the house, break out of the house and stuff. And so we lived on the end of a cul-de-sac with the woods in our backyard, and we had a trampoline. So, you know, at <laughs> night, I let them sneak out, and I, wa- I I was outside laying on the trampoline. They couldn't see me. It was too dark. We're in the middle of the woods. And uh, I see, and it's like one road coming to the house. I see their friend pull up in the car and kill the lights and, and coast down the road to get them. And then they jump in. They leave. And then I ran in the house, and I just – and their bedroom was on the second floor, and they made this whole – get up so they could get back up into the house you know like they they took the patio furniture set up by the thing so they could climb up on the roof and so i ran in and i started just locking every window and every door in the house and my ex she was like what are you doing i'm like uh well you know the kids just snuck out of the house and well why didn't you stop them she starts yelling at me i'm like because this is going to be a lot more fun (laughs) what's going to happen is they're going to come back they're going to climb up on the roof they're going to try to get in the window, find that it's going to, when that's locked. They're going to be like, oh, shit. And they're going to come to the front door and knock on the door where I'll be waiting. <laughs> well, part of that plan worked. So exactly what I said happened. I just waited. They came, and then all of a sudden, you know, my son, he's climbing up on the roof. I hear him go, shit. <laughs> but then what I didn't count on is they climbed back down, and they just left again. <laughs> so then, <laughs> then they were like loitering at the Seven Eleven, and the cops brought them home at like two o'clock in the morning while I was waiting. And I just had a grin on my face when the cops brought them. <laughs> so the next day was my youngest daughter's fifth birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese. Oh man! So I was always, I was always creative with punishments because you know what? Most of the stuff parents do, it doesn't work, and kids don't care. You got to do something that they're going to remember, and they're not ever going to do that crap again. <laughs> so I made sandwich boards, you know, oh, the big geez. poster boards front and back with a rope tied to them. And it said, <laughs> I will not sneak out of the house and be brought home by the cops at 2 o'clock in the morning ever again. And I said to them, here's what's going to happen. You're going to wear these sandwich boards at Chuck E. Cheese at your uh, sister's birthday party. <laughs> and if you refuse, there's a worse option. So you don't really have a choice. And I am going to take pictures, and I am going to videotape it. Uh, and this was before social media and before smartphones, so it was like literally a video camera. <laughs> and you videotaped it on a v- VHS. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and if you ever try this shit again, I'm going to get all your teenage friends, and I'm going to invite them over to the house, and I'm going to show them some home movies. <laughs> and then it was really good because we're at Chuck E. Cheese, and my one daughter, who was all cocky, she was like, you know, laughing about it, you know, thinking like, ah, this is no big deal, blah, blah, blah. 
lucky me, there was a a table of about 20 80 plus year old Jewish ladies. <laughs> and one of them comes over and sees her thing and, and says, Oh my God, will you look at this? Hey, Rose, come over here and check this out. And she brought all her friends over. My daughter was so freaking pissed because now <laughs> it was becoming a big scene. You know? Yeah, and-, and then. Uh, so then we left Chuck E. Cheese, and they started up in the car on the way home. Now, on the way home, we passed by the mall, which is their hangout. <laughs> and I was like, you better chill it out right now, because I'll tell you what. You got through it, but if you keep mouthing off to me, the next stop is the mall. And, and they shut. <laughs> but I will tell you right now, they never snuck out of the house ever again. And they've warned their younger siblings as well. <laughs> nice. I like the fact that instead of Dragon Con at Chuck E. Cheese, y'all ran into Bubble Con. Yeah, no doubt. Oh, yeah. Gra- I couldn't have planned it better if I paid these old ladies. <laughs> I mean, it was just classic. Oh, man. That is so beautiful. Yeah, I love creative punishments because, like I say, most things don't stick. Most things wind up punishing the parent more. And, uh, you know, it's. Yeah. When you do stuff like grounding them, too, it it punishes you because either you can't go anywhere or if you do, they're just going to sneak out. My dad used to punish me, and then he'd go out partying, and I'd leave, and I knew when he came back, and he, he was oblivious. He didn't know. Like, what kind of punishment is this? This is stupid. Yeah. yeah I mean, hell, you send a kid to their room today, and okay. They got they, they yeah. computers, phone, everything there. Yeah, hell, send me. I thought I was cool because I had a 13-inch black and white TV in my room. Oh, I was Yeah, no doubt, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know what? Nowadays, if you wanted to punish your kids, you'd make them go outside. Yeah. Like uh, sending them to their room is like a, a reward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I did see a, a neat thing. Uh, my kids have actually towed the line since I saw this and kind of mentioned it to them. Told them, I said, I'm not going to take your electronics. I'm just going to take all your chargers. That way they can just watch them slowly drain. Oh, yeah, that's even better. That's like a slow death. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of like just stabbing somebody in the liver as opposed to, you know, just, yeah, you're just going to go and get them and let them just go on slow. <laughs> no doubt. I got great parent stories. I my I was definitely creative. I was also a jokester, too. And, you know, my son just posted something. He's 35. He posted something on social media recently about having to do with, uh, you know, being a father to your kid. I, I got to find it while we're on here. And it's just a prank type of thing. And I, I, I was like, I trained you. I commented. I said, I trained you right. So I'll tell you a quick story that's great is that, um, you know, uh, he – he came to me with some very serious advice one time during a very crucial age. And he basically came up to me. He's like, dad, how do you get rid of dingleberries? <laughs> and he was, he was dead freaking serious. Okay. And I was like, and I just with a total straight face, didn't even hesitate. Said, I'm like, you mean you don't shave there? And that was before manscaping, like people <laughs> manscape now. <laughs> so then I forgot about it, walked away. A couple days later, he comes up to me. He's like, man, it itches. <laughs> and I didn't even know what he was talking about at first because I forgot. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I did what you told me to. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I just started dying laughing. I'm like, how do you even do that? And we joke about it now to this day. And he he uh, he says, yeah, I invented manscaping. Uh you know, he uh, it, it, and he it's like something he does to this day. <laughs> but the thing he's pissed off most about to this day that he's most pissed about is that when he was in first grade, he was lying about something. He just was doing the whole deny till you die thing. Mm-hmm. And so I gave him one last chance to fess up. And I said. I have a surefire lie detector test, so this is your last chance to tell me the truth because then I'm giving you the lie detector test, and it will tell me if you're lying or not. And he just still stuck to it, 
So basically, the, the lie detector test, and I told him how it would work. I'm like, I'm going to take this cup, and I'm going to throw, I'm going to pour water in it, and I'm going to pour wa- oil in it, and I'm going to mix it up. And if the oil rises to the top, you're lying. <laughs> 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 so, so then in middle school, he he tells me later he's in middle school one day, and they're in science class where they're doing this project with the oil and water, and he yelled out in class like he got in trouble because he yelled out in class that asshole because <laughs> that was when he realized that it was bullshit. Uh, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I, I like the Dinkleberry story, but here's the kind of dad that I am. I'd have just looked up from what I was doing and said, duct tape, and just went back to what I was doing. <laughs> that the, the the shaving thing, awesome. Duct tape, instant gratification. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you. Well, that, is the redneck, that is the redneck way to manscape, isn't it? It is. It is. Oh, yeah. With duct tape, and if you get really creative, you can cut shapes in the duct tape first. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to go on ahead and tell you now. You know, I learned this from Rodney Carrington. If you try and shave a heart down there, it just winds up looking like a liver. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, Pipe, man, I tell you, dude, I'm having a ball. You know you're welcome on here anytime. I don't care when or what, man. All you got to do is holler and say, fat boy, let's record. And, All right, yeah, and we'll have to bring you on my show too, and then uh, you know I I can you know embarrass you too, and you know make you the center of all all the butts of my jokes. Hey, it'll work. That'll work, man. I won't, I know I want everybody to listen to W four C Y because I know you're on there from ten to twelve on weekdays Eastern. That's correct, and I also so that uh, my live show is called The Adventures of Pipe Man. And we also take parts of that and put it on iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, and about 100 others. And I do uh, music interviews that you can catch on uh, Pipe Man in the Pit on uh, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you can listen to podcasts. And uh, there's all kinds of things I do. And definitely going to want to follow me on social media because The Adventures of Pipe Man is not just the name of the show. It's the real deal. I'm, I'm doing all kinds of adventures like you never even know what's going to happen next. So all you got to do is look for Pipe Man Radio, P-I-P-E-M-A-N Radio. Follow me. I'm on everything. I'm on, you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Snapchat, TikTok, TikTok, uh, you know, uh, Insta, Fanny, oh, and Instagram too, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm on, you know, my favorite, whatever. You know, if there's a social media thing on out there, I'm on it. And if there's a make-believe one, I'm on that one, too. Fancy. <laughs> well, outstanding, man. And, yeah, we're gonna, we're definitely going to follow because you're an interesting cat. I know this. But, oh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you, sir, and it's been my pleasure and honor and that you allowed me on your show because, you know, I'm, like, banned from pretty much every show in the United States, so I had to, like, pay off some Mexican uh, politician to get on your show, so thanks a lot. Hey, that's how I got you on my show. What the hell? 